So you don't know what's going on in Sean's head, but it doesn't look good. Brian De Palma. Brian De Palma, nous sommes ravis de vous accueillir à la Cinémathèque française. Je disais en introduction que vous avez réalisé 30 longs métrages depuis les années 60 et que lorsque la Cinémathèque française vous a demandé quel film vous vouliez projeter avant votre masterclass, vous avez répondu sans aucune hésitation « Casualty of War ». Vous n'avez pas donné le second choix, c'était celui-là. Ma première question est évidente, c'est pourquoi « Casualty of War » Pourquoi ce film pour représenter votre cinéma aujourd'hui Et en quoi ce film a-t-il été et est-il aussi important pour vous I think the story, which is based on a real event that was reported in the New Yorker in 1969, epitomized my feeling about the Vietnam War, the, the innocent rape of this country. And it was a very difficult movie to get made. People would option the material, and then they'd get a script done, and then it would go nowhere. And it was only because of the success of The Untouchables that I had enough muscle to get the movie made. And I'll never forget the, we, we developed the script with David Rabe at uh, Paramount. This brilliant script that he wrote. And when we had the meeting with the head executive, Ned Tannen, and he just looked at us and say, who wants to see this? This is depressing, this is awful. And they put it in turnaround. So fortunately, Dawn Steele, who was now president of Columbia Pictures and had been head of Michael J. Fox's company, wanted to do the movie. And this movie only got done because this very popular star, Michael J. Fox, from Back to the Future, as you might remember, committed to do the movie. That's the only reason it got done. And uh, it's a very sad movie. I can't listen to that score. C'est un film très triste. À chaque fois que je réentends la musique, ça me ça me bouleverse. And it's difficult for me to watch. Il est très difficile de revoir ce film. C'est c'est vrai que c'est un film très difficile à voir. Parce que, comme pour le personnage, on a le sentiment de regarder un film comme un cauchemar les yeux ouverts. Et c'est sans doute aussi ce qui a fait que le film, en partie aux états unis a été rejeté et que le film a été critiqué. C'est qu'en fait, il était très difficile à regarder, tout simplement. Ma question, c'est, est-ce que, d'une certaine manière, vous ne et que la difficulté que vous avez avec Hollywood, c'est que vous espérez former par vos films un spectateur adulte. Vous demandez à votre spectateur, comme à votre personnage, de faire un trajet de conscience. Et que vous demandez au spectateur d'être adulte avec un art, le cinéma, qui se conçoit majoritairement comme un divertissement. Est-ce que cette contradiction-là vous l'avez affronté toute votre carrière. Well, it's a very difficult subject matter, especially for an American audience. Uh, and uh, so I was so struck by the original story. And I later sort of retold it and redacted because we did the same thing in Iraq. Mm -hmm. You know, we send these innocent boys over there in these crazy, ridiculous <laughs> wars 
and they basically go crazy and do really bad things. And uh, it got a brilliant review by Pauline Kael, one of the best reviews I've ever gotten, basically. And, and sh she really understood the movie. But then, of course, it died. Nobody went to see it. And uh, c'est la vie. <laughs> Est-ce pour cette raison que vous avez coupé les deux scènes qu'on a vues Est-ce que ces deux scènes, vous les avez coupées volontairement ou à la demande du studio Well, you know, the ridiculous Hollywood system of testing a movie like this, mm. you know, what kind of reaction you're going to get. Not very positive, like, oh my God, do we have to see this? And these two scenes were in the original movie, but, you know, you get pressure from the studio, you know, as though we're going to make it any less horrible. But it's important to know, and why I wanted the scenes, and I put them back in the DVD, when it, uh, is the fact the army wasn't happy about what he was doing. And you had to see that the, the way they interrogated him, you know, th they wanted to break him down, because this was not something that obviously they were proud of. So it was very important to n not let uh, uh, Michael J. Fox get off the hook. They just lacerated him. And especially at the end of the last uh, cross-examination when the guy says, oh, yeah, you were where? Uh, way somewhere? You did nothing? And it just dramatizes how, how he feels that he failed. He did nothing. He didn't act. He didn't save her. And to me, it's very sad. Vous l'avez dit au début, euh, le film a pu se faire grâce à Michael G. Fox. Et Casualty of War fait s'affronter deux personnages, euh, donc le sergent Miserve et le soldat Erickson. Donc d'un côté Sean Penn, qui est un acteur qu'on pourrait qualifier un acteur de la méthode, euh, méthode acteur, et, le, le, et de l'autre côté, euh, Michael G. Fox, qui lui, à cette époque-là, était un comédien très populaire. Comment s'est passé le tournage entre deux, entre Michael J. Fox et Sean Penn. Oui, oui, oui. Euh... <laughs> Sean never spoke to Michael J. Fox through the whole movie. He was always the Sarge. He ha hung out with the army guys. Had nothing to do with him. I mean, you know, there wasn't a lot of places to go in the jungle. <laughs> But Sean would treat him like he was kryptonite. <laughs> And uh, there are like two instances. You know, Michael's a very amiable guy. You know, wants to be friendly, he steps off the stage, he wants to talk to everybody. Sean would have nothing to do with him. So this came to a head when Michael J. Fox comes after him with that shovel. And we rehearsed the scene a couple of times, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, Sean would taunt him, uh, and, 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 and then we'd cut and we'd try it again, and Sean would taunt him some more. And then, and then suddenly, in one of the takes, he literally knocked him to the ground. Just. And Michael Jake Fox got up with a look in his eye that could kill. <laughs> And that's the shot that's in the film. And, you know, when they're all passing him by, uh, the soldiers are passing him by where he, after the trial, and he whispers in his ear, what do you think he said? Que croyez-vous qu'il lui a dit? Television actor. Il, il y a une autre scène avec Sean Penn particulièrement étonnante, c'est celle où Sean Penn se rase. Alors, au moment où il se rase, à la fois par le simple fait qu'il se rase à ce moment-là du film, et parce que c'est vous qui le filmez, 
On a l'impression d'un personnage complètement borderline. On se demande s'il va faire un massacre ou s'il va se trancher la gorge. Mais à ce moment-là aussi, vous utilisez une technique qui vous est propre, qui est presque une signature visuelle, c'est-à-dire que vous utilisez le, le split focus effect, c'est-à-dire un plan où vous faites le point aussi bien sur le visage au tout premier plan que sur les figures qui sont au fond du plan. Une sorte de profondeur de champ où tout est net. Et plus largement, on a le sentiment, et c'est ce qui fait votre force, c'est que vous êtes un cinéaste qui se demande en permanence comment il va pouvoir exploiter l'espace du plan et le rendre le plus dynamique possible. Yes. <rire> C'est vrai. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous parler de ce split focus effect Est-ce est que c'est vous qui l'avez inventé Just focuses the audience on the two planes you want them to be looking at. Because you don't know what's going on in Sean's head, but it doesn't look good. <laughs> C'est très proche d'un autre effet visuel, d'une autre signature qui vous est propre, qui est le split screen, l'écran partagé. Là, on a l'impression que vous trouvez le moyen de faire un split screen autrement. Pourquoi cette figure du split screen vous a tellement obsédé Well, I shot a whole movie in split screen Dionysus in 69 where I I was photographing the uh, development of the play before me, and Bob Fury was showing the reaction of the audience to the players. That's where I first uh, 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 saw split screen in, in that documentary that I made. And I used it again very well in uh, Sisters, where the reporter is meeting the police and trying to get them to come upstairs where she saw the murder take place. And on the other side of the screen is uh, uh, William Findlay and Margot Kidder cleaning up the blood from uh, the murder that was committed. And it ends at the doorway when the police get there and on one side of the door is Margot Kidder and uh, her husband and on the other side is the police and the reporter. It's like over the shoulder shots. Split screen is very good for just uh, for juxtaposing simultaneous actions and they sort of comment on each other. And you have the audience sort of putting together something from the two images. However, <laughs> it is not good for action which I discovered in the prom uh, post blood on carry disaster, which I shot all in split screen. And as you was, uh, note in the movie, uh, there's a little of the split screen in the beginning, but uh, we discovered that it is not good for action, and we pulled most of the split screen out and did more or less Action, reaction, cutting from then on. Quand, euh, quand, quand, vous, quand vous lisez un livre, quand vous marchez dans la rue, quand vous écoutez de la musique, est-ce que des, est-ce qu'on a l'impression, ou est-ce que c'est vrai que des images vous viennent immédiatement de ce que vous voyez, de ce que vous lisez, de ce que vous entendez Est-ce que c'est comme ça que les idées les plus visuelles de vos films vous viennent Est-ce que comme Ami Irving dans Fury, vous avez des visions. Oh my God. <laughs> well, to make an example like uh, The Untouchables. Um, There's supposed to be uh, a train chase in which uh, Elliot Ness's guys go after uh, Al Capone's accountant. But uh, we were over budget and couldn't afford a train chase. So in the back of my brain, from my days at cinema school, 
I remember a staircase and a baby carriage. <laughs> and I said to my production designer, find me a staircase. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we shot in that location for seven nights. And unlike most of the uh, most of the uh, way I prepare for a film, I just sort of made it up as I went along. I didn't have time to storyboard it. I just got there. And uh, what's very interesting about that sequence and, and something that one learns from Hitchcock is that you have to very carefully orient people to the spaces you're in so they know where everything is when the action begins. And the great example of that is the crop duster scene where you see the bus arrive, Cary Grant get off, and you see him look across one direction and then look in another direction. Otherwise, he takes a very long time to set up the spatial relations in the scene before the action or when the crop duster arrives. And you have to be able to engage the audience interest because you must do this very slowly. So Ness comes in and he goes to the top of the staircase on the balcony. You establish his points of view. The doors where the passengers going to the trains will come in. The clock. Tick, 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 tick. <laughs> the stairs. And why do we look at the stairs? That poor woman is trying to get her baby carriage up them. So you keep the audience engaged because you've got a woman with a baby carriage going up the stairs. Donc well, là, he, pardon. Well, he's waiting for the people to come through the doors. And the clock is going tick, tick, tick. And when the gangsters come through the doors, he's got a baby carriage in the midst of all this, and then the action begins. En tant que en tant que spectateur de vos films, on a plein d'exemples parce que vous nous donnez plein d'exemples de situations comme celles que vous venez de décrire spectaculaires. On pense en particulier parce qu'on vient de voir Casualty of War. On pense par exemple à cette galerie souterraine, ce tunnel, l'idée de faire une coupe dans la terre pour qu'on voit le sous-sol de cette guerre. Euh, mais on pense aussi à, à Tom Cruise au bout d'un fil dans Mission Impossible. On, il y a des dizaines d'exemples. Et il y en a un que j'aime beaucoup, c'est dans Carrie, la mort de Piper Laurie. Pour tuer la mère de Carrie, je crois que vous, vous la faites mourir par télékinésie avec des des ustensiles de cuisine qui sont projetés, alors que je crois qu'elle ne meurt pas du tout comme ça dans le livre. The wonderful thing about Carrie, they've remade it many, many, many times. And they have scrupulously done it the way the book was written, and it just doesn't work as a movie. Et ça ne le fait pas comme film. So when I saw that scene in the book and I looked at the screenwriter and I said, she has a heart attack? I shoot Carrie looking at her and she goes, come on, nobody, come on. This is telekinesis, this is Carrie. Let's think of something Oh, look at those utensils over there. So if we're going to crucify her with utensils, now why would she do that? And that's when I told the art director, Mr. Jack Fisk, let's put a little, little crucifix in her closet with a saint with lots of arrows in him. And uh, if you prefer the other ones, you can watch the other carries and watch her have a heart attack. Une, une chose qu'on dit peu, à mon avis, à propos de vos films, c'est à quel point 
les histoires que vous racontez, tout aussi invraisemblables ou folles qu'elles sont, euh, ont une grande part pour vous d'autobiographie. Ce sont souvent des histoires personnelles. Au sens, par exemple, d'un film peu connu comme Home Movies ou d'un film très connu comme Dress to Kill, le personnage de Case Gordon ou euh, John Travolta dans Blowout. Il me, vous avez des grandes affinités avec ces personnages-là et en quoi ces personnages-là parlent de vous quels sont vos points communs avec eux Well, I was a bit of a computer nerd when I was in high school. Ah, yes, that's right. I did tape record the girls' sex education class. <laughs> Can you believe it? Uh, one of the girls in the class said, you can't do that. <laughs> And I said, I'll figure out how to do it. So I ran a microphone up from the library. I hid it in the table in the sex education class. And I taped the whole class. Can you imagine what girls were saying in the 50s? Ay, ay, ay. I'm hot. I'm hot. What is that? I was so proud of what I had done. I had the tape. But the problem when you do a secret tape is Who do you play it for? And I was so proud of what I had done. I played it for the girl that said I couldn't do it. And she turned me in. Alors, le reste de la question, ce serait ceci. Vos, vos héros, ceux qu'on a décrits, Case Gordon ou John Travolta dans Blowout, sont à la fois très efficients, très compétents, ont beaucoup de connaissances techniques, et en même temps, ils sont, il y a quelque chose en eux d'une impuissance ou d'un retard à l'allumage. Ils ont un problème avec l'action. Même Michael G. Fox dans Outrage, il agit et il n'agit pas. Qu'est-ce que c'est que ce, ce personnage Ah, oh, the psychoanalysis. <laughs> okay. Ah là là, la psychanalyse. Doctor. <laughs> okay. When I was a little boy, <laughs> I had an older brother who was very sensitive. He was an artist. And uh, we were in a very, uh, how I say, tempestuous family. And I, little me, tried to protect him and mostly failed. So that's that person who's trying to do the right thing, but because I was a little boy, I wasn't able to do much. But that's the kind of reoccurring theme you see in my movies. Thank you, doctor. I feel a lot better now. Vous avez décrit, on sait à quel point quand vous vous préparez un film, vous le préméditez, vous le dessinez, vous le répétez. Mais on sait aussi, peut-être moins, que vous avez, vous l'avez décrit avec les, les incorruptibles, vous avez une faculté, de, vous avez une faculté d'adaptation à, à des situations. Il y a un film en France qui a eu un énorme succès, enfin pour nous, qui a été vraiment important, qui c'est Carlitos Way. Et la fin de Carlitos Way, le final de Carlitos Way, est pour nous une des plus belles choses que vous ayez jamais faites. Et pourtant, vous dites parfois, ce que vous avez aimé dans la fin de Carlitos Way, ça aurait pu être encore plus spectaculaire. Well, again, that's an example of, uh, I don't know if this answers your question, but I think so. it's an example of, uh, I had prepared a very elaborate uh, shootout on the escalators in the World Tower, the World, Trade Center. World Trade Center. And I had, uh, you know, sketched out all the camera positions. They had like these really long escalators that went to the subway. And we were scheduled to go shoot it, and suddenly the uh, terrorist uh, blew up uh, the bottom of the World Trade Center. 
This is before 9-11. It's the first time they tried to blow it up. So I said, uh, suppose uh, he takes a train to, the, to Florida. So uh, find me an escalator in the Grand Central Station. And again, that is an example of one scene that was very carefully plotted out. Now I had to find the, another location to redo the scene, which starts with that very elaborate uh, steady cam shot when Al comes in and goes around and back and forth and down and whatever. You have to give Al a lot of credit. He's like a dancer and uh, the way he moves. And when you have to do a complicated shot like that, everything's got to work exactly perfectly. And he did it, and it's in the film, and aren't we all lucky? <laughs> Mais entre la séquence du World Trade, combien de temps vous avez développé la séquence du World Trade Center et combien de temps vous avez eu pour vous adapter à la nouvelle situation? No, it was another example of, you know, here we are in Grand Central, uh, Al's coming in, he's being followed by the guys that are trying to kill him. Okay, yeah, let me think. Uh, Larry McConkey, who was a fantastic Steadicam uh, operator, I would, you know, work the thing out and, uh, and I'd say, okay, now we got him when he's going down on the escalator. And that's when he, the big guy sees him and he shoots him. And that's when the shootout begins. Yeah. Bang, 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 bang. And then Al uh, races to the train and, of course, gets shot by Benny Blanco. I think you're trying to suggest that some of my best sequences <laughs> are not the ones that I plan, but the ones I have to make up as I go along. En, en préparant cette discussion avec vous, j'ai lu et relu des entretiens et j'ai été frappé par une chose. À quel point dans la carrière d'un cinéaste, il y a parfois autant de films réalisés et parfois plus même de projets non réalisés. C'est fou le nombre de scénarios qui s'écrivent, d'histoires qui se projettent et qui s'espèrent et qui ne se réalisent pas. C'est, euh, je ne sais pas, Nazi Gold, Ambrose Chappell, sont des, parmi les scénarios que vous avez envisagé et on se rend compte en, en suivant votre trajectoire à Hollywood que les films sont en fait adviennent grâce à des accidents heureux ou au contraire il y a une mauvaise conjonction dans tous ces projets non réalisés si demain vous pouviez en réaliser un vraiment ce serait lequel which brings me to our book All the projects that were never done are right in here. <laughs> Every idea I and Susan ever had is in this book. You read this, you will understand everything. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, there are a lot of things we never got to make and, uh, and a lot of story ideas that still lie in my computer. Uh, some of which appear in this book, uh, but uh, that's, again, c'est la vie, that's life. A, a lot of being, I don't know, successful or whatever you want to call it, you have to have good luck. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes out of tragedy comes very good luck. The fact that something bad happens leads to something else. So keep at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> An example of that is uh, uh, I was developing Fatal Attraction, which was based on a short written and directed by the writer of Fatal Attraction. And I was a little concerned that the producers were a little squeamish. Horrific ending that I don't know if they were too comfortable with. So... The thing that really, really turned me away from the project was late at night I saw the short that the writer had made, which the feature was based on. And I said, that short is perfect. What, what's the point of making this movie? So I had a very difficult breakfast with Sherry Lansing 
And I looked at her and I said, Sherry, I can't do this movie. And the next week, Art Linson, a producer at Paramount, offered me The Untouchables, and the rest is history. Ce qu'on trouve aussi, en, enfin ce qu'on comprend en, 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 comment dire, en regardant votre trajet à Hollywood, c'est à quel point un cinéaste hollywoodien, et vous en particulier, devez être persistant. Vous êtes presque un combattant, c'est-à-dire qu'il faut vraiment se battre en permanence et vous êtes absolument déterminé en fait. Yeah. Well, after I made Carlito's Way, uh, I remember it was shown at the Berlin Film Festival. And I was like standing in the wings looking at it uh, on the big screen. And I said to myself, I can't make a better picture than this. I said, I'm going to have to make a big hit. <laughs> so. Fortunately, uh, my agent went insane for some reason, I don't know why. And uh, Michael Ovitz, who had been trying to represent me for years, said, Brian, why don't you come over to CAA? Would you be interested in working on uh, Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise? And you see that in a cartoon, stars <laughs> flashing goodbye eyes. <laughs> Tom Cruise, Mission Impossible, <laughs> of course. That's how I made a big hit. Une dernière question avant de passer la, la parole au public. Cette dernière question porte sur euh, votre dernier film hollywoodien à cette date, qui est Mission to Mars. On sait les difficultés que vous avez eues sur le tournage, mais ma question est un peu différente. Euh, je voudrais que vous imaginiez ce film en tant que spectateur qui voit un film de Brian de Palma. Parce que, est-ce qu'on ne pourrait pas dire aussi, en dehors de toutes les difficultés que vous avez eues sur ce film, que le fait de faire un film dans l'espace a été une sorte d'accomplissement pour vous par rapport au cinéaste que vous êtes Pendant 30 films et depuis le début des années 60, vous n'avez vous cessé de faire voler votre caméra. Vous avez fait des panoramiques à 360 degrés, des travelling, des caméras subjectives, des, de la steadicam. Et d'une certaine manière, est-ce que lorsque vous avez filmé de l'espace dans l'espace, vous n'êtes pas arrivé à un accomplissement en tant que cinéaste Est-ce que vous avez pris du pla un plaisir particulier à filmer ces scènes dans l'espace et de l'espace <rire> Shooting in space is horrible. <laughs> you have to put them in these horrible suits that takes hours. And then you've got to hang them on wires. And just when you're about to shoot, somebody says, I have to pee. <laughs> uh, Mission, um, uh, Mission to Mars, uh, I came on because the former director uh, had a budget of, a, I think, $140 million, and the studio said, no way. So uh, I said, well, I'll see if I can do it for $120 million. And uh, he left, and I took it over. Um, and it was a kind of a challenge, you know, being a a science geek, uh, you know, I knew all about Mars and the face on Mars, and I liked the mythology of it. And, and I think uh, the thing you have to sort of get across to an audience is that these guys that have gone, uh, you know, to the moon or, you know, up to the space station, they have a kind of magical belief uh, that is kind of awe-inspiring. And I fear that the audience missed the cackling Brian De Palma in the making of this film. 
the famous De Palma cackle. I was trying to reflect the kind of idealism and spiritualism of these uh, astronauts. Uh, um, and that was Mission to Mars. Si vous avez des questions, des réactions des, par rapport au film, par rapport à ce que De Palma a dit, c'est maintenant. Voilà. Comment vous voyez la transformation technique aujourd'hui du cinéma, de l'exploitation des films, le tournage Quand on commence à regarder des films dans des plus petits écrans, de plus en plus petits, et, et l'arrivée du numérique Well, I like all the technology, but uh, being a science nerd that I am, I'm very aware of it all, and I use it, uh, uh, all the digital you know, shooting and digital editing, all that stuff. But the big problem for me is that uh, I need a big screen because I have these big visual sequences. So uh, that doesn't help me much the digital technology you need a big screen to see these movies je voulais revenir moi sur outrage il se trouve que la semaine dernière j'ai lu une interview de de Coppola à l'époque où il était en train de monter Apocalypse Now et il parlait de son film Apocalypse Now comme d'un voyage etc., mais aussi d'une réflexion sur le bien le mal et la morale et en revoyant euh, effectivement Outrage, que j'ai aussi vu euh, très peu de fois parce qu'il euh, est très dur à voir. J'ai compris euh, que vous étiez euh, ému, comme beaucoup de gens ici. Euh, je voulais savoir si euh, c'était aussi quelque chose que vous vouliez euh, 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 qu'on perçoive dans ce film. Le bien, la morale, le bien et le mal. Wow uh... I don't quite know how to answer that question. Uh, Apocalypse Now is a kind of everybody going mad movie and done almost surrealistically. Uh, Casualties of War is a very uh, tight story about you know these guys abusing and killing this girl. Uh, them going mad also in a whole different way. Uh, and I find that it's, it's, I find that it's a very uh, good screenplay by David Rabe and, uh, and that's why I think it affects uh, everybody, or at least myself, so emotionally. Uh, je voulais savoir à propos de Outrage, quelles avaient été vos principales inspirations pour le film Well, I thought it was the best story about our involvement in Vietnam told in a kind of microcosm. And uh, I've always wondered what happened to the girl that played that part. She was French. She, she lived in Paris. She was, Twee, are you out there? <laughs> what happened to Twee is... She gave a magnificent performance. She was speaking Vietnamese through the whole movie. Uh, and I've never seen her since. But I think she's somewhere here in France. Come back, Twi. Avant de venir, j'ai regardé un documentaire qui vous est consacré, donc c'était en 2015, où vous passez l'ensemble de vos films au peine fin et vous concluez par cette phrase vous dites que les, les films d'un réalisateur uh, it's a record of things you didn't finish basically uh, qu'entendez-vous par là s'il vous plaît didn't finish how did you get that idea I think I was drinking when I was interviewed <laughs> I'm not finished. Et, de, et quand est-ce qu'on verra Domino Ah, oh, Domino. Domino, Domino. Well, it was a very difficult production because it seemed to be underfinanced 
Uh, I sat in a hotel room for many days waiting to start shooting again. Uh, a lot of people didn't get paid. Things moved very slowly. But miracle of miracles, we finally finished it. And hopefully it will be coming to your local cinema sometime. Vous avez travaillé avec les meilleurs compositeurs de musique de film. Je voulais savoir comment vous faisiez pour choisir tel ou tel compositeur pour tel film. Est-ce que vous attendiez une sonorité spécifique de la part de ces compositeurs Well, the good ones are working all the time is one problem. And I was very fortunate to get uh, Bernard Herman who was working in England to come back and do Sisters and Obsession. So I started with one of the great masters uh, of uh, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, I would say. Uh, but I'm very strongly affected by music. Uh, this Morricone score is, you know, just makes me cry. Uh, And I worked with him. He did, did a wonderful score for Mission to Mars and The Untouchables. Uh, and I've also worked with Pino Donaggio for many pictures because Bernard Herrmann died. And then Pino came over and did uh, uh, Carrie. And I've made uh, many movies with him, like Dress to Kill. It goes on and on. Uh, but. You, you know, you select a composer like you select an actor. You're the right kind of po composer for the type of movie you're making. And I've been very fortunate because uh, I've worked with, you know, I think the best. And I like my movies because you get to hear the music. Unlike a lot of movies which they drown the score and effects and explosions. Euh, en tant que réalisateur de, de nombreux chefs-d'œuvre sur des sujets différents et, et désormais euh, écrivain, quels sont, selon vous, les, les principaux critères d'un très bon scénario I'm going over in my mind these great screenplays that I read. Let me think. What makes a great... Well, you develop screenplays that turn out to be quite great. I think Casualty of War with David Rabe was a marvelous screenplay. Uh, David Mamet's uh, The Untouchables was a marvelous screenplay. I mean, but you would get this screenplay and then you worked with the writer to make it uh, into a movie and give him different story suggestions in order to make it as good as it could be de la part de toute la Cinémathèque et de toute l'audience qui est ici. Un grand, grand merci, Brian de Palma, pour vos films et pour votre temps et votre présence. Merci.